name future grants by our training. Its citation described his film in an artful in an, uh, uh, in an art form where an increasing number of critics are arguing that much globalized art takes the form of hollowed out visual experimental. Opikinka's work insists on an Indian epistemology while utilizing a rigorously formal visual language that is clearly aware of Western of about practices such as those of Andre Tarkovsky and Samuel Beckett. These are self-consciously digital works that are filmed in a self-consciously beautiful way. He teaches at the at, uh, University of uh, Rhodes Island as an associate from Sir Film and Media. And he received his PhD from Stanford. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bora. Uh, for inviting me and thank you uh, everybody for coming early uh, on the second day. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, in line with the general imperatives of the conference that looks at sound, sight and location, I'm going to do uh, almost what you would call a show and tell. I'm going to show you some clips, talk about it and uh, my basic idea of what I'm trying to present is to, I'm not presenting an argument, I'm, pre I'm kind of almost sharing a form of practice that I have inculcated over the last 20 years. I have been working with uh, a sound recordist for the past 10 years, some of you might know, Shukhanto Mujumdar, who is Bodha's uh, friend and a year junior. No, he has seen it to him from the Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute of India in Calcutta. And so uh, a lot of work that we do is in the part is we, we collaborate a lot. Uh, and so I'm going to show you some stuff uh, that we have recently collaborated with and something that I did before I started working with, uh, with uh, Shukanto. One, one of the key aspects of my work is that it comes from a a very non-commercial, non-popular form, which uh, has been incorrectly labeled as avant-garde, because there's nothing kind of, there's nothing like an avant-garde in India. So uh, the way to think of it is, scholars have thought about it is in a in a more. Uh, they've used this word called prayog, which is. Uh, a word that is comes from yoga, so it's pra yoga, which could be pre or f post or even excessive form of practice. That's the way it has been described for the last 15 years, the kind of work I do, uh, where the idea is essentially that a lot of work that I do and the work that I am part of, like the larger group of filmmakers, we are deeply embedded uh, in an Indian epistemological and an Indian ontological universe and what we are trying to do in our filmic work is to explore that and articulate that which is coming or which is emerging directly in contradiction to the other huge bimoth that exists in Indian cinematic modernity that is commercial Hindi cinema and now multiple languages that have emerged in the last cinema that, is, that exists in the last, has become really formidable in the last 50 years, is so we, we are working completely in opposition to that. And what I'm trying to, what we are trying to do, or and specifically what I'm trying to do, is to create a body of work that not only challenges that form of commercial narrative that has become synonymous with Indian cinema, but also to create a form that is in conversation with a pre-modern, pre canonical pre epistemic system. Now, this is coming from a pretty complex maneuvering 
where one that all of uh, one of the things that we recognize, or especially I recognize, that cinema is essentially a modernistic apparatus, both in its uh, technological and in its uh, philosophical form. However, how is it possible to use such a modern apparatus to create a world that can be in conversation with, I think for the lack of a better word, we're kind of calling it pre-modern, and that's a huge world, like we talk about more than 2,000 to 3,000 years of epistemic and ontological uh, articulation. And what I'm trying to do in my film is to kind of open up this kind of, uh, open up a, a dialogue uh, with the past. That also comes uh, from my own training. I've been trained bef before I uh, did my PhD in anthropology, I've been trained as an archaeologist. So I've spent uh, many years working in uh, excavations in different parts of India. And a lot of that work kind of re-emerges in this cinematic world that I'm trying to create, which, and especially in the context of this conference, has a very strong sonic oral world that I'm trying to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first show you a work which is not mine, but which is something that I think is very, uh, I'm just, it's a six minute film by a filmmaker called Pramod Pati. He made this film in 1967. It's a film called Explorer, which, uh, it's a six minute film. I'm just going to show you a very short clip, probably about a couple of, two or three minutes, to just give you an idea of the kind of sonic work or sound work that was being done in the 60s. Uh, and this is a very small window that you see in India within, within the documentary, propaganda documentary organization of the state called the Films Division, where from 1967 to 1969, a very interesting bunch of people started making what you could, what could be called uh, experiment on avant-garde, and I am the reason I'm showing you that I'm, I'm, I'm the, the sonic world, speci specifically the world, the way the music and sound that is used. I'm trying. What I'm is that I'm coming from that genealogy, although not directly, but in a certain sense. So um, just going to show you. <coughs>
However, by 1930s, with the rise of the talkies, mm -hmm. this form of religious cinema slowly died down, and it has a resurgence nearly 50 years later with the rise of Indian television in the 1980s, when television penetrated into Indian uh, into the Indian chosen sphere. That religious narrative again emerged, uh, unlike the early narratives of early cinema. In, uh, which was basically a few hours, a couple of hours, the, the length of the narrative cinema. In the case of television, they went for weeks, and in the case, in many cases, went for years. So much so today, uh, a great number of Indian cable television is religious television. And uh, anthropologists, and this is uh, you know how s political spheres are formulated. One of the most important reasons for the rise of Hindu fundamentalism that we have seen in India in the last 30 years, scholars have argued that a big contribution of that rise has been the rise of religious television, which emerged in the 1980s in the form of soap operas and series. But now we see a, like, a huge network of religious television which is constantly creating this form of uh, a Hindutva consciousness, this <coughs> radical Hindu consciousness. And what I'm trying to do in my film is revoking that kind of relationship, however, not in a political or in a, in a, in a fundamentalist form. Because I fundamentally, I, I, I very strongly believe that with this rise of Hindu religiosity, this rise of Hindu fundamentalism, it is very important to create an archive of moving images which contradicts that form of fundamentalist essential, uh, let's say, fundamentalist essentialization that you see throughout the Indian moving images right now. So my, my attempt in these films are to kind of probably very feeble, almost inactive, weak, but a, a zone, so as to say, a zone in the sense of Tarkovsky's stalkerish kind of a zone, which is completely outside the, the world view. So this is a film, uh, and what, as, as, as I'm trying to, uh, the, the relationship with sound is that one of the key elements of this film and the subsequent film is that sound becomes a very formidable part of creating that kind of a religious sphere. And out here, for example, in, in, the, in the clip that I showed you, the first element was in the form of these intense drumming, which is synonymous with, uh, with these kinds of, with spe specifically religious uh, ceremonies and rituals in Bengal. And the mantric form, the form of uh, invocation of the mantras, which are very, very important mm, in the uh, Indian religious sphere, which I use constantly uh, to create a, of, uh, to create a sense of a sonic uh, religiosity based essentially on orality. So I'm now going to show you another sequence from another film, which again deals with Kali. Uh, this is a film uh, which was made 15 years uh, later, mm -hmm. and. Uh, which uses, um, so this uh, again a trigger warning of sorts, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of nudity in this film, I hope uh, you don't mind. Uh, so I'm just going to start with, uh, this, is, this is the big name which uses, this particular big name which is about three or four minutes long, uses uh, a very specific uh, <coughs> mantras uh, from a very specific religious uh, practice. Just swimming. And so one of the reasons, one of the things that I also do in, in my films when these mantras come, I do not translate them because they work as sonic devices rather than epistemic devices. <laughs> Bye-bye. 
deliberately used to construct a sonic sphere where verbalization of certain stories and affect is constructed or used or employed <coughs> to construct a form of a sonic morality. So I'm going to show you uh, a sequence from that film. Just something very random. Uh, Uh, the film uh, so consists of these 13 couples who are sitting in a post-wedding gathering and, and they have this conversation. जनिपथेपा चुमो खबर Constructing a sonic morality, 
where the sound space is constructed out of dialogical conversation of these 13 characters. Uh, most of my film, and as, as well, none of my films are done sing sound. Uh, one of the reasons we I can't do sing sound in India is, uh, for instance, essentially because it's very difficult to sanitize local environment to make it completely soundless so as to do sing sound. I don't have that kind of budget. So uh, th this film and, and uh, the other other stuff that you've been watching were all constructed, were dubbed, or we did post sync uh, sound recording. <coughs> along with the, 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 the sound space that is constructed, everything occurs on Pro Tools and in Sound Studio. Uh, in, and the idea of, is to use this kind of a digital platform to construct uh, a sonic sphere. Uh, so it's an artificial construction of a naturalistic sound space, uh, both using uh, dubbing artists some of the some of the actors that are that you see, their voices have not been used. Other people's voices have been used, depending on my own fascination for certain kind of voice. So this film hugely works on this kind of a sound, uh, the, the verbal oral vocality of sound that comes from. Uh, the final sequence or the final film I'm going to show you was a film uh, that. Uh, I just finished a uh, few about, about a year ago. Uh, and here I just wanted to show you some sequences with music. Uh, the way I have been using music uh, and probably a couple of other sequences. Uh, again, this has a bit of community. I hope you guys don't mind. Yeah, I'm going to start with this conversation, just at the end of this conversation, then show you.
Well, one of the things that we have to understand about cinema is that it is fundamentally a Western. It, it is a modern. I won't even call it Western. It's a modern apparatus, and it was. It is. It's. It's in origin. It is like so many things that we live in. Uh, comes from Western modernity, or and you can go back. The genealogy can go back as early as Enlightenment. Uh, but however, what has happened is that when it moves into places like India or in these non-Western spaces, it gets very. Uh, the initial, at least in the case of uh, cinema, initially it was very rapidly transformed into as a vehicle for Indian consciousness in the form of Indian religiosity. However, by 1930s in India, with the rise of Indian nationalism, that religiosity element kind of decreases in cinema, uh, specifically because of the Hindu Muslim violence that emerges and nationalism that emerges that Indian cinema becomes more driven through social drama and the religious elements almost dies down in North Indian cinema. You do see religious elements, uh, pretty strong religious films happening in Southern Indian, in, in Tamil cinema, in Telugu cinema for instance. Uh, what I am trying to do, is, is I, I don't think so it's about resisting any form of imperialism, I think it is constructing a form of parallel representation sphere. Uh, I live half the I live most of the time in the U.S. So, so it's it's kind of I mean you can one can think of my films as coming from the same uh, uh, emerging from the same world which is neoliberal late capitalist, but constructing a more subversive form because one of the, one of the other other element about my films that I haven't spoken about is that I don't work. With a producer, I don't work within within the logic of capital and within the logic of market. These are self-financed films, not as uh, as a vanity exercise, but as a political exercise. Because the moment you go to the marketplace, the moment you go to producers, you have to follow a logic that the market forces you to, which which may or may not be conscious. Uh, often it is unconscious that there's certain logic of the market that forces you to create a work which, which is compromised. And the, in the case of India, arguably there is not a single uncompromised work coming out for in the last 50 years. One of the biggest reasons is first is that the Indian state is hugely uh, regressive. So we have a very strong sensitive regime. So none of my films, for instance, can be shown uh, Formally in India, they are shown in underground and, and subterranean circuits, but they cannot be. They cannot have a public sphere. Uh, and for for any film to work or to any film to circulate within the public sphere, they have to be censored. And the censor uh, regime in India is so uh, what should I say obnoxious that they can go at any length to censor anything. So that's one. The second thing is the nature of film uh, production and exhibition in India, which is highly subjected to market pressure. And that, so along with the market pressure, or let's say the market logic uh, buttressed with the uh, Indian censorship regime, you have the work that gets circulated and that, gets, that moves across from India is deeply compromised. And so in that sense, I would think that my work is comes outside that that zone. Uh, as I said, I, I would not consider it to be anti-imperialist, but definitely a form of subversion, a form of uh, radicalness within the larger post-colonial, late capitalist, mm -hmm. neoliberal world that we all exist in, which is almost inescapable. But one can also read the, the, these subversive tactics that are using. Uh, against uh, some other um, impositions, like uh, for them censorship. Censorship yeah, absolutely. in India comes from like you know, the explicit nudities, nudities that we see in the world generally, uh, that is a kind of a subversive tactic or rebellion. Absolutely. Censorship is extremely Victorian, uh, and usually this Victorian uh, mindset comes from and yeah, I, in that sense, I would agree. Yeah. So this is a rebellion. I can read. Really That's kind of obvious. Second uh, point is that, uh, as as you mentioned, orality 
if you think of morality and recorded history, because I would like to also point out here that when recording media came to India in 1902, like uh, gramophone company, there was a huge resistance against recording. Like Zubat is the oldest form of Indian classical music, and musicians didn't want to record their voice because they thought that the, the, the constraint of recording media, because it was 2 minutes 13 seconds, uh, their open improvisational form will be distorted and uh, hindered and violated. So there is a huge form of resistance in any kind of recording media. So if we take this binary, which we read from McLuhan, that orality versus recording, then uh, where McLuhan is clearly saying that orality is a kind of primitive form of culture, this revival of orality, this pre-cinematic production of reality in India is something you are trying to again revive. So I'm trying to understand whether you have something to say about that. You know, I, for me, uh, the, the, the emphasis on orality comes not from a recording history, but comes from uh, how contemporary representation in cinema, and I'm talking about what we would generally call art cinema that circulates in film festivals. You have a rise of, uh, of, of kind of cinema, what's called slow cinema. Now, one of the key elements of slow cinema is a, a, a very strong fixation, almost fetishization on the cinema, cinematic image, so much so orality is completely subdued. Uh, and the rise of slow cinema emerges uh, around the late 1990s and early 2000s, which is the rise of neoliberalism, which allows for, so slow cinema is emerging at the same time you have films, what we, what we would call chaos cinema, the kind of films that come, that will be produced by Michael Bay, uh, the Transformers series and, the, and the, uh, these extraordinary fast-paced films which also completely denudes the oral where there's, uh, in, in a 90-minute film you have nearly 5,000 cuts. Uh, that the f visual fixation is so intense in both these highly commercial uh, pop cinema and slow cinema, what, what you see is very interesting is that both forms are emerging as a, as, as a product of neoliberal late capitalism and both extinguish the oral and there's a very deep fixation on the visual I'll come to you for a minute and, and what happens is that slow cinema and, and this other cinema both have this form of circularity essentially because the oral as in the linguistic oral is subdued so Rati Chakravi, for instance, is a direct response to that. That I will kill the image by having a single shot. And perspective. And perspective. And, and, and the oral, oral and verbalization will be the form through which the visual is imagined. Yeah, you, you had an intervention. Yeah, just a quick point before I ask the question. I don't think it's true that slow cinema subdues sound. So do you think no, I'm not saying two examples. Sound. Can I talk about? Yeah, sorry. Um, two examples: Vlad Diaz and uh, Ben Rivers both have a very strong focus on sound. So, um, but my point was, um, I often ask the question: When, when does a film become a film, or how does a film become a film? And the conclusion sometimes I come to is that film is an imperialistic medium. So a good example is um, this film you showed us, the first one, Explorer, which is an amazing piece of work which I've never seen before. So thank you for that. But to me the strongest element of the film is the sound. And, and yet we talk about it as a film and we talk about the director but we don't even hear the name of the person who produces someone. So I wonder what you think about that, the, the way the film takes over everything and, and the director becomes the most important element in the film, even if, if the sonic element is much stronger. So uh, to get to answer the slow cinema question, I, for me it was, I, I'm not saying that slow cinema is devoid of sound, I'm saying, saying that slow cinema is devoid of linguistic oralization. And so what you see in slow cinema 
uh, and not the examples that you have mentioned, but generally I've seen in, in my understanding or my research on slow cinema, there's a folk that in comparison to early art cinema that would that would exist in the, let's say in the between this between fifties to the nineties, uh, the linguistic element in the form of oralization in slow cinema is far more subdued. So I was not talking about sound, I was talking more about orality. Uh, about, and I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, one of the reasons that the director becomes important is that cinema is, has been conceived as an ocular form rather than a sonic form. And, uh, and the birth of cinema was essentially soundless. So by the time sound comes, nearly 30 years later, the sound recorders or the sound designers are already at the back seat. However, as I said, one of the reasons of showing you Explorer is that it is not just a visual uh, ocular exuberance, but it is usually, and you're absolutely right, that the sound plays a fundamental role, that the music design plays a fundamental role, and uh, you're also right that we do not, specifically in the case of uh, uh, these films that were made in the 1960s, and specifically in this, we don't hear about the sound recordist or the sound designer or uh, the music. Well, even to talk about sound recordist or sound designer, um, in a sense, um, creates a hierarchy. Um, Absolutely. You're looking about a kind of technician um, who is subservient to an artist. I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, it's specifically, it's, you're right in the context of how films uh, within, the, within the industrial logic of the film, uh, that you have these kinds of hierarchies being constructed, uh, but that is not the case, for example, in the films that I make where, uh, although there is, as, as a film director, my, uh, let's say my uh, vision does play a more important role, or let's say I kind of direct or guide the vision, or the sound vision that I have in mind while working with the sound artist. So, however, I think of it as a collaboration. For example, the last uh, sequence, the last two sequences of the violin and the, uh, and even the earlier film uh, about uh, the, where, the, where you see the woman dancing is a film that both I and Shikanto, the sound, took nearly about a year and a half to uh, construct. Uh, which, which involved a lot of back and forth between both of us to construct that kind of oral world. So I would agree with you. I mean, there's no disagreement in that context. However, the nature of industrial form that cinema is, that hierarchies are inbuilt in that industrial form. Yeah, but you're supposed to be subverting that. I'm not sure if I'm able to. I am, yeah. I, I can't hear you. At some of, uh, when you were playing one of your sequences, you referred to it as a composition. Yeah. Probably. 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 That, that could be another way of looking at it. the same terminology as Any other questions? Thank you.